It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I'm Bree. I'm currently playing Chris um, in POTUS at Virginia Rep. And like Mark mentioned, I also work uh, for the marketing department at Theater Communications Group. So I had been like familiar with POTUS before this, um, and now I'm getting a chance to dive in head first, which has been really cool. Um, and I'll jump into it. Um, since we do have a few questions here for you, um, the first one is, I know you've spoken a bit before about your inspiration and how it was an amalgamation of things you had seen, but we're curious to know if there was any initial inspiration that was the seed of you being like, whoa, okay, I have to put this pen to paper about this. Yeah, the I mean, the ideas had sort of been building in me over a lifetime of existence. Um, but I think the, I think the catalyzing event was during um, Trump's campaign when the pussy grabbing tape was released. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't shocked that he said it, um, but I was fascinated by how everyone scrambled to respond. And I was, it was an interesting moment. I don't know if like you remember, but it was an interesting moment with the media because the media was like, are, are we allowed to say it? <laughs> you know? It was this really yeah. interesting thing where one person's offhand comment, one presidential candidate's offhand comment forever changed the landscape of media and how things are reported because, you know, there were these words that were not allowed to be said. And all of a sudden it was like, okay, one person can decide that we're doing this now. Um, so that was what really fascinated me about it. And that's when I started to write it. Um, and you know, I was working on it off and on. I was had other plays I was kind of supposed to be working on at the time. <laughs> um, so that one was, I was just like kind of secretly doing it for me. Um, and then, and then after Trump was elected, you know, the, the stats came, the poll stats came out that like white women had voted for him en masse. Mm -hmm. And I just really started to think about the ways in which people vote against their own interests. And I, and, um, and the ways in which like particularly white women are complicit in our own subjugation and the subjugation of others. And so I think that's when it really started to change. You know, it started to go from just kind of this screed that I was writing to more of kind of a battle cry or, or a manifesto. Um, and then there were so many things that happened over the course of me writing it. You know, there was like the Kavanaugh trial, that was a big one. Um, so it kind of kept on changing with the world. Um, the, and it was also just never about electoral politics specifically. I said it in the white house because that's the highest office in the land. But to me, it was a story that you could put in, um, you know, any institution, um, many households. Um, yeah. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, I feel like you touched on this a little bit, but I am um, curious also to know if you consider yourself to be like a deeply political person and then how those views influence your writing, if they do, or if you try and keep your writing somewhat separate from your personal views. Well, I think when people say politics, they usually mean electoral politics. Um, and I I don't think of it that way. I guess I do identify as a very political person, but um, because I see the political in everything and I don't think you can separate it from identity um, or or anything, you know, like I think it's present like at every family table. I think it's present in every uh, classroom, every office, ev on the streets, everywhere. The way that everything about our society is, the everything about the way our society runs, I think is political. And so I see it everywhere and I observe it everywhere and I think about it all the time and and it permeates my writing. Um, so in that way, I do consider myself a very political person um, and I vote and and um, I organize and I you know try to turn up in all the ways that I can. But um, I wouldn't say I'm one of those people that follows electoral politics moment to moment. <laughs> you know, I try to stay abreast um so that i can you know show up and and vote in an educated manner but um i'm a 
strong believer in grassroots organizing and local organizing mm -hmm. and progressive organizing. I think that that's where change really happens. I think that stuff trickles up to electoral politics, not the other way around. Um, so that's where I try to put most of my uh, energy. That makes a lot of sense. And I do think your note on casting belies that a bit in that you were aware and made sure to be explicit about the fact that the way that the women are cast and the bodies that they inhabit can how that can actually affect the relationships that they each have interpersonally one-on-one -on -one, um based on how they speak to one another and that's something that i think people are coming to be a little bit more cognizant about even an example i was talking um, with a friend earlier about how new york is coming up with this congestion tax for cars in midtown and this article just came out in the New York Times about how there are all these groups of people lobbying for exemptions, uh, which range from like city judges uh, to the police department to a luxury building on the west side that has a parking garage. So like you said, that's not electoral politics per se, but there is something so political about the types of groups that believe they should be exempt from what is essentially a tax that is supposed to kind of like better the overhaul health health of um the city so i think that's that's I didn't important. Know about that that's fascinating yeah and that's i think in a way much more relatable um because i do think the average american will tell you that they probably are not you know nose glued to everything that's going on electorally they pay attention when the big hits come along but people can relate to those interpersonal politics and like you said how they play out when they're at work or when they're at the dinner table. Um, and I think that's part of what makes POTUS something that's so relatable to so many people, whether they are people who might lean politically liberally or people who might be going to church every Sunday and are very buttoned up. But when they get here, they recognize the way that like this is playing out across uh, everyone's lives. So that's, um, yeah, of course, I was gonna say it's really smart. And it was one of the things that I was super impressed with when I first read the play, but I'll get further into uh, writing and all that as we go down the line. Um, but the next question that I do have um, is, you know, women's voices are so important, probably more now than ever, especially because we're starting to see the effect that they can have now that they're being allowed to kind of like ring free. And I'm just curious about where you see the trajectory of, or where you would like to see the trajectory of female leadership um, taking theater, particularly in the next few years. Yeah, this is a really <laughs> tricky question for me, um, just because I feel like I could talk about this for such a long time. I think that the, and I think that what we're talking about, we have to get into such a long conversation about the structure of theater in America. And, and so that's why it's like so complicated for me. I guess I'll step back for a second and say that like my feminism is so inextricably linked to labor movements or anti-racist movements or, uh, you know, queer movements. And so I think that those sort of it, it's impossible for me to talk about it separately and I think that if you're talking about it separately you're not actually talking about feminism because I just think that they're they're so inextricably linked and so when we talk about you know women in leadership and stuff like that I think it's so important to be like it's not enough to just put a woman in a place of power I mean that is so much of what the the play is about right like it's not enough to just put a woman in a in um, a place of power um, or a person of color in a position of power or a, or you know like it's it's not that does not in and of itself change a system um, if their politics or are still invested in maintaining the status quo which unfortunately so often happens when people have experienced oppression and they're put in a position of power there's mm -hmm. like this like you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like cinch everything up and close the window behind me, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I think that's, it's a really complicated um, question and theater is in such a hard spot right now. Um, and it's just been such a long time coming, this, this um, 
position that theater is in that people are talking about because you know we don't have a government subsidized you know theater or like so many arts programs it's often not taught in schools and so you have generations of people that are um that are coming up with no interest in going to theater or have a very particular association with um what it means to go to a play and stuff like that so um i think when we we have to talk about what what theater can be and what it can bring to people and I think about this often in terms of like concerts because people say like nobody gives money to theater and stuff and and that everyone is strapped and like for money and cash and all this stuff right now and all of that is true and yet like people are showing up for Beyonce's tour right like so it's uh-huh. like you know, they're young people are like, they save up all year for it, you know, they find a way to prioritize that. And so it's like, okay, well, what are people getting from going to a concert that they don't think that they can get from going to the theater? Um, and, and I try to think that way. And it was something I thought about a lot with like POTUS, which is like, how can it feel actually like you're going to a concert where you're kind of like, you're like talking back to it and you're physically engaged and there is like music and there's this like sense of exhilaration and community. Like all of those things are are important to me. I know I'm not answering your question directly, but I guess I don't know how to, I think talking about women in leadership, of course, we want equity, we want parity we want respect and to be, you know, treated as valued players in the field and have our art programmed, you know, to the same degree and all of that stuff. And obviously I could go on and on about the small ways and the big ways in which sexism can play out in that stuff. But I think it's more interesting to look at it in terms of like theater as a whole, because once again, theater is just a microcosm of how everything else in this country works. And so, again it's like you kind of have to approach it in the same way that you approach um whether we're approaching all these other things it's like turning around this ship that has been on this path for a really long time you know so like 400 years you know so we have to sort of like you know do this and it's a slow grind um and it takes a lot of sometimes it takes a lot of slow steady work and then i think sometimes it takes a lot of kind of like combustive um, disruptive work. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that that's rambling and not exactly what you were asking for, but it's just such a complex subject that I wouldn't even know how to give like a pithy answer to that. <laughs> no, I loved it, but I also understand exactly what you meant about it being dangerous because there are so many things I could say, and then this would just turn into us having a conversation right about, about like the being alive. alive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for twenty five minutes, but it's true. I think like what can sometimes seem like the easy answer is putting different people into seats of power but POTUS is a really great example of again like you said things that play out in the real world we've seen in theater and outside of theater people of color um women queer people being put into positions of power but maybe sometimes without the support um in order to do the job that they're now in place to do or sometimes with pushback, I think when trying to actually um, radicalize systems and create a different way of doing something that people aren't ready for, because maybe they are used to people just coming in and doing the same thing, no matter what they look like or what their lived experience is like, um, at the risk of sounding like a paid ad for the New York Times. <laughs> they also had a really interesting um, kind of breakdown where they talked to theater critics about this like surgeons of jukebox musicals that are using early 2000s, largely written by um, women music. And one um, critic made a really interesting point where she, she talked about how in a lot of these um, stories, the kind of ending to the fairy tale of finding your true love has been replaced with this ending of women um, taking power and how there's kind of like a dissonance and also a dissatisfaction to having that be the end of the story because in real life we all know it's so much messier than that um and I think that that is what is so fascinating again about the play like we had not only table work but just in the middle of rehearsals so many conversations about what does it mean um that there are certain people who are really invested 
in the way that things work right now, no matter how on fire things are by the end of the show versus people who um, have never had a vested interest, people who have had that realization earlier. And then on top of that, the personal relationships they have with one another. So you all will yeah. have to see the show to get the rest. Yeah, but. yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's such an interesting, it's such an interesting thing. And also I think it's that proximity to power, right? You know, like I had a vested interest. I, I had a faith in, um, you know, figures of authority and establishment way longer than I should have because of how I was raised and because of who I am mm -hmm. and how the world treats me. And so that proximity to power, there's like this investment in being like, no, 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 I'll just play the game harder. If I play the game harder, right. it will work. It'll work. They must not be playing the game hard enough. Mm -hmm. It's my fault, you know? Yeah. I, I think that sort of um, cycle of self-talk, which honestly like relies on a, a type of self-punishing and like mm -hmm. individualism, um, is is so real and then yeah just I think just putting I have often been so disappointed by by women in power and being like you are not representing my best interests um and that should not be anti-feminist to say in fact I think that being able to disagree and have conflict and have intergenerational conversations and debate and all those things are really integral to having a successful movement of any kind Absolutely. And to be able to hold one another accountable. I think that that's something that's also integral to community, which again, we lose when we become hyper-focused on individualism. But I think with best intentions in mind, that's how democracy should work, right? right. Um, I'll move us on <laughs> because we have many questions to get to. Um, but thank you so much for that. That was a treat for me personally. Um, and you know, actually the last thing I will say is to your point as well about how audiences receive theater, especially versus concerts and how POTUS can be a vehicle for that being something that's different. One thing I've noticed even just having one week of shows in the belt is that no matter how silent an audience we have, we might think that they're really hating what's going on. When it comes time uh, for Dusty to stall, uh, for the FML audience, suddenly everyone is very alive and very present. And um, you can really, I, I think that there's something to be said about creating the space for people to feel as though it is that type of experience, that theater for a really long time, uh, especially in kind of the mainstream and more commercial space hasn't done because that wasn't what it was about. So it's really cool to see how that's affecting um, people, especially in a space outside of New York, which actually leads to my next question, which is that um, POTUS was a huge hit on Broadway. And now that it's entered the regional market, what do you hope that audiences across the country will take away from seeing your play? Do you think that there's room for huge differences in, in how people um, are receiving this versus how people saw it in New York? I'm, I'm certain. I would be very curious to hear more about your um, experience. I will say the first time that the play was ever workshopped anywhere was in Lubbock, Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it's not that it has only played to New York audiences. In my experience, conservatives think that the play is about Bill Clinton and liberals think that the play mm -hmm. is about Trump and people do have a good time pretty much across the board in my experience. Um, and I also like had, you know, conservative like family members and people go to see the show in New York and have a good time. So even though I am, you know, uh, have progressive politics, um, I don't think that the play is partisan. I really did not set out to do something about electoral politics. So it is very political, but it is not partisan, um, nor did I want it to be. And I feel like I am very critical of like mainstream, uh, mainstream democratic establishment, <laughs> you know? So I don't think it's like some sort of uh, propaganda for any uh, political party at all. Um, I, I am curious about, I mean, I do think, I do think foul language um, uh, plays differently in different communities for sure. And so that can be um, alienating for some. I hope that if people can hang in there, even if they find it um, kind of abrasive, they realize that it is a critique of people speaking this way. It's not mm -hmm. like, um, it's the, the whole point is that something really terrible was said 
in a office that is supposed to have like honor and respect and a sacred, you know, some sort of <laughs> sacred aura around it. Um, and so the whole point is like a critique of these people and the question of why did, is, can this person who later went on to become president, why was he able to say this stuff? And why are we so put off when we, the, when the non-famous non-men around him speak the same way? And what does that mean? So um, yeah, I mean, it's been wild just to see it take off. I, you know, when you write something, you always hope it will have universal appeal that I really didn't anticipate it. And it has really swept through the South in particular. There have been multiple, you know, productions in Florida and Texas and um, North Carolina, South Carolina, all these places that I find really, um, I, I just was like, uh, like in awe and so excited to see that they were like some of the first places to program it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that kind of drives home the, the, what I was saying earlier, which is like, it really isn't partisan. Um, and it's really not about electoral politics. It's, you know, about these other systems that actually permeate, you know, both of our major electoral parties. Absolutely. Have you had a chance to see any of the regional productions or do you have it on your schedule? Um, to I'm, I'm leaving today to go to Berkeley Rep. Um, oh my gosh. Which is where I'm going to be for um, the next week for rehearsals. So I, I'm not involved with, with most of them. There were mm -hmm. a few regional productions that I had relationships with and knew the directors. And so they asked me to come in and be a little involved. So um, I'm a, about to go off to Berkeley Rep. I'm um, involved in the Geffen at the LA in at the in LA and um, Arena Stage in DC and um, Steppenwolf in Chicago. So I'll I'll see a few of those um, and any that I'm like available <laughs> to, <Right>. to talk <laughs> over to. Um, they were I think stages um, in Houston just opened recently and. Um, I knew an actress who was in it and I know the director, she played Stephanie in the original like Texas Tech oh reading of it. So um, it's just really moving to me. It's going to be playing internationally as well oh. um, in Montreal. And I think Queensland just, uh, I think licensed it. And um, yeah, it's getting translated into some other languages. So I like the, the reach has really blown me away. <laughs> That's super exciting. Yeah. Now, I've been a part of new shows where the writer was a part of the process, but they were also, you know, rewriting and workshopping as we were um, going through the rehearsal process. What's the collaborative process like to come back to a production that's set writing wise um, and like be working in tandem with the director? Yes, it's weird. Um, I It's new for me as well. I mean, I think everything about the the Broadway production was like kind of not traditional like it went up cold and it went up mm -hmm. fast and mm -hmm. a lot of it kind of was like tailored to that specific kind of cast mm -hmm. and and um moment and so there have are like a few adjustments and also it just was so fast I think when you're moving that fast of course it's like mistakes can be made so it's been helpful because in working with all these things like I've had a director be like is this a typo? And be like, oh God, it is a typo. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, wow. so being able to like make a couple adjustments and send those off to the, you know, um, the people who publish it. So I'd be like, can you, you know, change this? So I really feel for the people who were doing it um, first who had to do it like with typos and all. And I was like, oh no, because I really <laughs> try to, um, you know, I take those very seriously. I try to give clean, clean copies to everybody. So it's a little tweaks here and there and seeing how can I make this as playable as possible in as many different um, theaters and communities as possible. Um, and yeah, I really don't want it to have to only be done with a big budget on Broadway. I want it to be able to be done in small theaters. When I wrote it initially, it never occurred to me that it would be done on Broadway. So I just assumed it would be done in a black box, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think things, being able to to do that, you know, and, and modify and adjust in that way, um, just to make it have as, as kind of universal, um, and long, long lasting. I, there were a few references to Twitter that I, I'm sort of tweaking, um, yeah. because Twitter of course has changed, yeah. you know, so you're, you're always trying to, um, make it as not dated as possible, but it's tricky. <laughs> right. 
yeah, I mean, things move so quickly now, the difference between something going yeah. up in even kind of like 95 and how long you would have to wait to sort of modernize that versus something that was created in like 2010. Um, yeah, so. it's my fault for including Twitter in the first place. That's what you get. I mean, that was that's on me a hundred percent. That should that has no place in literature. Why are we doing that? <laughs> They'll look back. They'll look back. Archaeologists, anthropologists, years from now. What the hell was this? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, another um, question I have about the play is something I was also really struck by um, when I first read it was the fact that the characters span so many different ages, some of which are ages you have yet to reach, and yet they were all written so sincerely and, and so um, in such a complex way. And I'm just curious about what it was like to put those characters together, whether it was a lot of research that was far from you or whether there were people who had been part of your life that you were able to kind of connect with in order to put those characters together? Yeah, I always get this question because I think a fair amount of my work centers on women in their like 50s and 60s mm -hmm. and um, people are always asking me about that and I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I've never written from my own, like I've never written based on my own life. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know, I guess I'm private or I find my own life boring or something. I don't know. But um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I think when you're writing anyone, I just try to listen, mm. you know, and I really admire, I just try to listen to what's being said because people, people do talk about their own lived experiences kind of consistently. I think it's what people talk about most is themselves and what they're feeling and what they've experienced. And I think often we tune it out. And especially if women over a certain age, we stop listening. And so I think if you just listen to what is being said, people are giving you all the information about their character that you need, you know? Um, and then you can sort of think about their lived circumstances and, and go, okay, well, what would have caused that belief? And what would, you know, um, I think the way that, the way that I write is not, I put a lot of myself into all of it. And with POTUS, I really feel like all seven, I have like, I have been all of those women at various <laughs> points, you know? But I think when it comes to lived experience, and this is always like a tricky conversation because I don't feel like everyone has the right to tell every story. But I do think that we are very empathetic people and that we've all experienced all of the emotions by the time we're like five or something, you know? And so the circumstances that cause those emotions really change. Um, and so that's where you have to use your imagination. But, you know, I know what it feels like to be lonely. I know what it feels like to be overlooked. I know what it feels like to be overextended. I know what it feels like to be, you know, not feeling, um, you know, valued. You know, I, I can those emotions are fine. So even though I, you know, I'm not a mom yet and I am not, you know, pumping all the time and I'm not, you know, trying to run for president necessarily. Like those are things though that I can imagine, like take this feeling, the small feeling that I've had and then put it on in those circumstances under those um, lights and stakes and all those things. And it's not hard for me to, to imagine what that would feel like. Um, but I, I really admire older older women and I feel very much like I walk you know um in in paths that they have already um you know tread and forged for me so I guess it's my way of kind of honoring them um but you know to me like Margaret's experience is as foreign to me as Dusty's experience you know mm -hmm. like you know I think they're they're all farther away so it's just sort of being like well what would make this person really like human what would make them tick what are the things they're dealing with all the time and what are those things that I relate to um that's sort of how I try to approach all all of my characters that's such a beautiful answer because as like a reader and an actor, I was really impressed 
by how well written the play was but also as a human I was like wow like I need to like pay attention a little bit more <laughs> to what's going on around. and and oh, even talking yes. about being you know being so in touch with your emotions and being able to zoom out and like you said have the empathy to think about what that would look like in someone else's lived experience so um yeah I love that 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 is how you explain talking about it because I think that that's something that we could all stand um to do a little bit more of even if we're not uh <laughs> hoping to write Broadway's next hit play I also just have a really overactive imagination which <laughs> in my daily life causes me a lot of anxiety but <laughs> but see what a healthy way to channel that I'm like okay a channel I can channel it this direction <laughs> instead of being like oh my god this thing could happen <laughs> yeah <Exactly. laughs> which I love. Um, and then again, speaking of Broadway, I'm just curious because I know um, you have worked on many a stage at this point and are now, I believe, going to another fellowship. What is, maybe not the biggest, but what how, how has the experience differed between producing something and putting it together um, for Broadway versus those off-Broadway stages? Mm. Um. I mean, Broadway is such a <laughs> a wild place just because it has such a further reach than most off-Broadway experiences. It is mm -hmm. a place that still um, people who never normally go to the theater will go when they're visiting New York and stuff like that. Um, and so the reach is so much further than anything that I um, had experienced before there's a lot of money riding on it. So the stakes feel incredibly high at all times for me, at least. Um, I, I felt incredibly aware the entire process mm -hmm. of what a big risk people were taking on me and on the project. Um, so yeah, that, that's like a huge, that was like a huge, um, a huge thing that I felt, which obviously you have to work very hard to block that out so you can just do the work because the work requires taking risks. And, you know, before it often feels like, well, it's just my soul on the line here. <laughs> and now it's like, it's my soul on the line then all these other people, like a lot of their money, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that's, and that's really um, scary and, uh, I don't know if that's something I'll ever totally get past. Um, this was also just, I think, a uniquely, it was also my Broadway debut. And I was um, at least kind of in the collective consciousness, a an unknown or, or emerging right. writer, um, which is always funny because like I've been writing and supporting myself as a writer for like over seven years now. But, you know, I was not known in any way so there was all this kind of there's this this buzz that happens where it starts to feel like the the words are like oh she's she's emerging she's a risk she's not unknown she's all these things that may both make me more appealing and also more like risky you know mm -hmm. um so that can do something weird to your psyche um and it was just big the play is big it's the it's a big cast um and it requires a ton of, at least, you know, when we were doing on Broadway, a ton of work to get the technical elements. And so there's just so many people involved top to bottom. And that's incredibly humbling to feel that you are um, kind of at the helm of like this massive thing. And the responsibility I felt with that was, was big. Um, of course, that's the case with all, with all off Broadway, with all shows, it always takes a village. So I don't want to diminish the amount of work that goes into it but I think the stakes to me felt so massive and I feel way more um comfortable I think working on just being able to like have the time to like talk to the sound designer you know um mm -hmm. which I still had the time I, I, like you make the time you know but I think it's nice to have those like person-to-person -person interactions in a way that when it's like so high octane and your things are moving so fast and mm -hmm. this is you know, people were getting COVID and we mm -hmm. had, to, you know, all of these things, we moved up our opening so that we were like, you know, so it was like all these things that happened um, that sort of made it all just like a total blur. Um, and so I don't know how much of that is unique to Broadway and how much is just like, 
part of it being like Broadway debut and um, first theater back and like after like massive lockdown sort of stuff, all these things made it really intense. So um, I don't know if I, if I'm lucky enough to be on Broadway again, maybe I'll let you know then, but um, it always feels, it always feels like this massive thing and you're always like is this gonna happen there's gonna be people coming to see this at, at any scale like wherever mm-hmm. you're doing it whether it's a staged reading or a, a workshop or a like tiny black box theater or Broadway it always feels like this can't possibly be ready tomorrow when people are coming and you know whatever it is <laughs> happens and it always feels like this absolute miracle um and that stays kind of the same but um, yeah, I think the actual like work stays pretty much the same. Maybe the distractions feel a little bigger the, the mm. more money is involved, of course. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I have one final question for you and it's a bit of what I hope is a fun one, uh, which is that at one point, I believe in an interview, you mentioned that you related most to Stephanie at the time out of the characters in the play. and. I'm curious to know if that is still the case um, and if not, who you feel like you relate to most now. Oh, fun. Um, I don't know if I related them. I don't, the, the, I don't know if I related the most to Stephanie. She was the one who I always thought I would play. Not mm, necessarily because I personally that. related to her, but I was just like, this is my skill set as a performer. And this would be the one that I think I would be best suited to play would be Stephanie. Um, so I, she does have that kind of millennial perfectionism where I often feel in any space like, oh my God, what should I get first? You're this copy for you or these papers for you, you know? Um, so I totally relate to that. Um, yeah, I think it's hard because I really do feel like they are each kind of facets of me. There are days, mm-hmm. you know, when I'm giving whatever interviews when I totally feel more jean like I'm wearing a turtleneck I mean like so I think there's days that I feel more jean like there's certainly days when I feel Harriet like um (laughs) I don't know if I've aged yet enough into my um queen era to identify with Margaret (laughs) um I'm sure when I have a kid I'll I'll feel like Chris sometimes um but yeah probably probably Stephanie is probably the closest to my experience, though I think that I like to think that I'm a little bit more uh, balanced and that I can do a better um, job of faking it in the way that Jean Mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That makes a lot of sense. I love that. And to close out, I think that everyone on this call can agree that turtlenecks are universally flattering. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, Oh, thank you for bringing that to the public's attention. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out to chat with me. Um, I am having such a blast and I'm really excited for the rest of our run. And I wish you all the best as you continue on your really, really exciting journey. Thank you. Give my love to the whole cast um and um I'm really I'm really touched that you took the time to talk to me when you're probably very tired from the first it's such an exhausting show um but and you have to throw things and do all sorts of stuff so <laughs> well I got to sleep in today because we kindly started this interview at eleven thirty eastern time so <laughs> great great <laughs> great I'll have an easy morning um so it was really a pleasure um I was happy Uh, to hop on board for this. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you.